So I did bring the bag even, which is amazing. I have a question to start us off. Um, if there's no introduction or anything, you guys did a fantastic job yesterday. You showed us some beautiful cattle that were imported years ago. And I wonder what advice would you give us as current Highland breeders to maintain that quality and take this breed forward? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Okay, this is my rump, Angus, and I will hang it out right now. <laughs> Just don't cut it off, please. <laughs> no, here's what my thought would be different. Um, we had this discussion the other night with John Ligo, too. <clears throat> and if you look at those three of us, which is interesting, you've got damn near 200 years of guys running cows in different parts of the world, different cows. Some dairy cows, some beef guys, some highland guys, and beef program, different. But the basic stuff we end up with, or the basic things you're looking for, I think are the same, which is amazing. How would two people halfway around the world have the same view of a cow in terms of what functionally works? So the things I would say, <coughs> a simple list to preserve at first would be, they need to travel, which means they need good feet, <coughs> they need good legs, they need good pasterns. <coughs> they tell this people over cows and horses which is amazing. If you want to beat yourself to death on a saddle horse, find one that, with a leg that stands like this. It's got no spring in the pastern. And when you do that, what they're going to do is total their knees, total their hips, total everything, total their hoof, total everything. So you want something that can travel, number one. Number two, when I tell people how to look at cattle or when I teach 4-H kids or other people to judge them, I said, take a business card out of your pocket. When I look down their back, some of the ones you look at in the old days look like the letter V inverted. And the ones that really were beef cows that came out when Angus's picture was up yesterday of the herd coming out, the artist who drew it, if you look at the backs of those cows, some were a V-shape and some were an upside down U. And what we did playing with carcasses 25 years ago is when you start to look at them, what you realize is if the shape is a U down their back, the ribeye's bigger, the tenderloin's bigger, the New York strip loin is bigger, the sirloin butt is bigger, etc. So what it does, it changes the cutout that way. But you can't sacrifice the ability of mobility, the ability to move, calving ease and stuff, just because you got a better carcass cut on the critter. But so we strive for keep their body, the Highlanders are not that short. What people forget is the heart girth. And the guy who did a lot of heart girth work years ago was Howard Lurie in Washington State, did quite a little bit of it. And what happens is if you add an inch of depth to a rib cage like this, what you add on the rail is between 42 and 61 pounds. Now, if you add an inch of length between the front of the hip and the back of the shoulder, you add between 51 and 64 pounds. Now, the difference is if it's ahead of the shoulder, it's worth $2 a pound. If it's behind the hip, it's worth $3 a pound. It's actually more than that now. But if you look between the front of the hip and the back of the shoulder, it's worth 8 bucks a pound. So my question to you is really simple. Do you want one inch of $8 a pound beef? Do you want one inch of $3 a pound beef? Or one inch of $2 a pound beef? So when I tell people I want them long, what I liked with Jim Welch and what I liked with Howard Laura when he unloaded Cube Mountain Edward from a trailer, I thought he was unloading a train. That bull had no end. When his hips came out of that trailer, that bull just kept coming up, coming up, coming up. Because what he had is an incredible long, but he didn't give up his back, he didn't give up his structure, he didn't give himself swayed out. But he gave good structure in terms of beef and cutouts and stuff like that, which is what you wanted. So I'd say, look at the basic things like that. And when I looked at the pictures that Walter Hill had in the Breeders Gazette 1923 set, I look at those cows and I didn't see any cows in there I would be ashamed to own at all. But a lot of it is he also creamed a whole lot of the best of Scotland. And A.W. Ross must have been good at doing it, Angus. I don't know who he was, but that's the guy who was the solicitor who bought him. He was an agent. He was the agent. He was good at it, though. Yeah. But he would be importing Angus's and short -arms. He knew the cattle business. So he was he good. he knew the American cattle business. Got you it. know, that was the business he, he was in. But he picked yeah. good ones. So when I look at those pictures, I'd say, if I was going to strive perfectly to say I'd love to have a better batch of cows, I'd make a batch of cows that look like those perfectly. And over the years, we called a lot of the temperament out. We called out all the bad feet. We called out the genes that went with that. <clears throat> but the other thing I learned is 
when they started to breed for certain things, we didn't measure what we took out. So when I told you the other day the average steer killed in 1946 was four, that's true. And everybody bred heifers who were two to calve at three. When I was a punk kid in the 70s, it was a big deal every September to take seven of us and go 15 miles and trail 600 steers that were long yearlings home. Nobody sold calves. This is 1971, 72, 73. Everybody, nobody sold calves. Everybody sold yearling heifers and yearling steers. And 1972 was the first year that the steers for the guys I worked for broke 800 pounds. They were calved in February, March. We trailed them home September, waited in the first week in October, and they weighed 802 pounds. And that was an incredible event. Now people ship calves that weigh 800 pounds, 750, 735. What we didn't do is when we measured them to grow faster and made early maturity, we never looked at what it did to longevity. So now an old Angus cow is 10. It used to be that wasn't the case. An old Hereford cow is 8 or 11. That didn't used to be the case because when we measured for one thing, breed them sooner, mature them earlier, we never looked at the other stuff we weren't doing. So that's the other thing I would just say is I'm serious. Is as you look at it, what you're trying to strive to get yourself to, then remember, you don't want to give up the other things that are things that you want. And I am sick always when I talk to Ted Hall and other people who bought cows years ago at the Denver Stock Show that were overfat, OFs. Overbreed and heifer, they don't breed. Overbreed a bull, they break down, and they break down quickly. And I used to have four bulls that were 16 or over that were all good, and they all worked fine. And they just kept going strong. And I knew what the genetics were, and I didn't breed them to their offspring and stuff, but I knew what they could go to in terms of which cows or five bulls. And so we were running lots of bulls then. But they ought to last that way. And they shouldn't be on the fight with each other, and they aren't, so they bang themselves up. And every black bull that's black Angus in the world is always beat up by the time they're four or five, because they had to push every kid in the neighborhood. First black Angus bull I saw on the range was 1973. Every cow in Montana was two colors, red and white. Black what? Black Angus? No, they were all Hereford cattle. The first time we picked up a black bull of our neighbors out of this bunch of Hereford cows, <clears throat> the guy I worked for was 75 and we were trailing this bull in and he said, you know, kid, the son of a bitch who cut the legs off that bull should be ashamed of himself. <laughs> but that bull for like 15 miles had to try every Hereford bull we came up to and every Hereford bull beat the hell out of him. And that black bull just kept doing it. And so why are they broken down? Why are their hips bad? Why are they stifled? Why are their shoulders broken? Why can't they do anything? Because they're always in the fight. So they shouldn't learn enough respect for it. So that's, those are simple little things, but that's too many years of doing it from guys who taught me. When I was 15, the guys who did the best job with me were 70 or 80. But they knew. Your dad was smart to send you that. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> 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 I'm going to bring it down to a more individual level. What each breeder in this room has to do is to focus really on what you're doing in your particular herd. Continually assess all the cattle you have, all aspects of it, and then you ask yourself, what do I need to improve? How can I get, or where do I find the genetics that are going to give me the particular characteristics I'm looking for, whilst possibly at the same time eliminating those that are less desirable? Uh, the elimination part of it is actually in your own hands. If you've got some cows that are not quite performing, get rid of them. Uh, you'll spend years buying different types of bulls, hoping you can suddenly turn this less than desirable animal into something they will never be. So don't, supposing it's your favorite cow, come on, that's not how it works. Uh, you look at, and never mind what your neighbor's doing. There are too many of us spend far too much time looking over the fence. Yeah, why is he now, at the same time, maybe if they are very successful, ask yourself why, yeah? but. Each individual herd is different. They all have different ca characteristics. You're working with slightly different genetics. 
It's vitally important in a breed like this. I hate to use the word minority breed. There's actually quite a lot of Highlanders running around. But we still work from a rather restricted genetic pool. And that's, globally, that's a, it's not a problem, but it's something we have to keep in mind. And try and keep the genetics as broad as possible and possibly take a risk on genetics that you maybe know little about. But if you hear or see of an animal and you think, wow, I'll take a chance on that. Uh, it's terribly difficult when a lot of people are only working with maybe eight, nine, ten cows, but you can still do it. But uh, focus on your own herd of cows. Try and eliminate the less desirable and look for the animal that will take you to the next, the next le level. And that Again, that depends. If you're strictly in the beef business, that's a little bit easier. You're looking for a bull with naturally good conformation that has matured early. And if you keep your eye on what's going on round about, you can identify those. Talk to people. This is a great opportunity to speak to people. You might have a conversation with somebody and they'll tell you, I've just weaned a calf that weighed this. This is the second time this third calver has produced calves that, and you think, right, that's interesting. What are you doing with this bull calf? You could take a chance on that and it might improve the overall conformation in your herd if you're totally commercially mi minded. If your focus is mainly selling breeding stock, females for instance, to other breeders, that's again slightly different, but you're still dealing with, as we've just heard, the same fundamentals. You've got to get the structure right. Uh, the more beautiful aspects will still be there, but if this wonderfully beautiful, graceful heifer, whose feet are less than desirable, whom you know was out of a cow whose udder collapsed when she was eight and a half year old, you get rid of that. I don't care how nice she is. And don't pan it off to somebody else. Don't do that. <laughs> I've seen it done. But if, yeah, really look and, and be critical of your own cat cattle. Uh, it's too easy to fall in love with them. Don't. Don't have affairs. Just <laughs> you can <laughs> like them, but don't love them. <laughs> if, you get, if you understand what I mean, because that makes it all the harder to make those decisions especially when you've got kids and they even love them more than you, you do. Why are we getting rid of Rosie? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> do it when the kid's in vacation. Send kids to Granny. What happened to Rosie? Ah, oh, well, you know. <laughs> Does that help? Thank you very much. Or if you don't, on the back, how about one? <laughs> I would say one other thing. Of Right. I'd say one other thing that's an, an interesting way to look at it. This is different, and this is perhaps I'm patient. Guys looked at me years ago and said, remember, kid, the fastest way to move cows is slow. And that is really, really good way to look at the way the whole thing should work, and that's what it takes. But also I realized early on, if you're going to make a difference in a highland bull or a highland cow and see the difference yourself, it's a five-year plan. You're not going to see what the difference a bull looks like if you bred five cows to a certain bull to see what you get. It's four years or five years before you know anything. Because you've got one year in the cow, then you've got two years to raise the bull up till the bull's come in three before you really see what the bull's going to look like. So you've got a minimum of four years in the program to try to improve something yourself, which is hard to do. So the lesson that came to that for me was, wait a second, look at the people that you end up getting cows from. So Lures had done it for 45 years when I ended up by their stock. Um, the same with Max Beeler, the same with Bill Sherrod, the same with those guys. So instead of having to do the 45 years myself to try to get somewhere to get an ass on a black bull that had some weight on the top of it instead of nothing, or to get temperament going or to get feet better, I looked at it from the approach of, wait a second, the people that I talked to that were 80 or 70 or 90 when I bought them out, those guys had done it for a long time. So I kind of bought the pre-done laboratory. But it still is three or four or five years. And then if it does not work or if they have bad structure or bad udders, that you cannot fix. So I'm with Angus. A lot of them need to go to McDonald's. Uh, 
We used to run a big Highland beef bu business, slaughtering, finishing, rearing, finishing, slaughtering 300 Highland steers a year. Uh, uh, that was a lot of work. But anyway, uh, I did a lot of weight recording then. All these animals would come in as approximately eight month old calves and I weighed them. And the wonderful thing was on the official documents we have are written the sire and the dam. I had a gold mine and over the years I recorded all this and I had all the genetic information. Uh, the longer we did it, the more information I had. To the extent that when I brought the calves in in the fall of the year, I split them into groups, knowing that calves from a particular place out of a particular sire would outperform others. And I knew I'd be able to slaughter them slightly earlier. I knew it was a waste of feeding, trying to do something with the bottom group when they wouldn't quite respond as well. So I allowed them to mature without putting too much into them, knowing full well they weren't going to do it. They were still perfectly good cattle, but it's going to take me six months longer to do it with them. Now that saved us an enormous amount of money doing that. And again, I had the opportunity to see them with the hides off, hanging on the rail, and I learned more by looking at all these cattle hanging on the rail than I ever learned walking around a show, show ring. They were hanging there on the hook. And I then saw what I had the figures for. And I thought, wow, this is... But it was a, I, I did, that's not the reason we did it. We're running a Highland beef business, but it's just something that fell into place as I was do, doing it. And I, I also did other experiments uh, with di diet in relation to performance. Uh, we, we, and people used to come and see this, and the first thing I would say to them when I took them round what we were doing, I would say, don't try this at home. And they thought I was being really rude. But we were in a very fortunate place. We had some extremely good old pasture on which Highland cattle thrive wonderfully. I had a slaughterhouse that took me 20 minutes to get to. I had a processing facility that was five minutes away. Now, if you can control these costs, you'll make money out of high Highland beef. A lot, a lot of other people were doing it. And I said, don't, your slaughterhouse is five hours away. What, what are you playing at? And you don't have a processing facility. Ah, but the butcher down the road says he might do it. No, no, it doesn't work like that. So we were in an extremely fortunate position. And we were, prob we were situated in one of the wealthiest parts of Sco Scotland, where people had a lot of spending power. And with a little bit of promotion, they could see these cattle when driving along the road. We opened a fa farm shop. All these things were in place. But I, as I say, I learned more doing that than I had learned in the previous 30 years. I wish I'd started there at that end. I wonder what sort of Highland herd I would have had if I'd started at the hook end and come the other way. But I started at that end and went that way. What age did you say you brought this calf in? Eight, eight months. Eight Weaned months. calves. Okay. It, Previous to doing that, I was buying cattle from all over Scotland, various ages. Some had been starved, some hadn't been looked after, and I thought, this doesn't work. So it was a long process. We would have 350 Highland steers in the place at any one time, maybe more. We had the room to do it. But I knew unless I was in control of the whole system, this wasn't going to work. We supplied beef 365 days a year. And that's where all that information was so important, knowing the ones that were going to respond well to the diet they were on and identifying those who were going to take longer to respond to that. But uh, if you, you never miss the opportunity to see Highlanders hanging in the hook. If you, know, if you slaughter an odd steer yourself, be sure you go and see it and see it split. And then you see the ribeye and they, wow, that's not as good as I thought. Yeah, get the ja jacket, get your own jacket off as well. Yeah.
I learned a lot there. It was such a wonderful chance to see the other side of the business. And a person who butchers can tell you a lot about your animal just by them oh, looking at yeah. it and, they, and cutting it. When they put the knife yeah, in the bacon, yeah. they knew they immediately. Can tell you if it's going to be tender or not. Mm -hmm. we, we learned it a different way. The first time I talked to Angus, he was talking about putting these calves he got in a barn, too, inside, or putting them pen separate. And that was so incredibly alien to somebody from Montana, because except for our dairies, we don't put cows in barns. That's like an unheard of thing, but it was a completely alien concept to me. But who I learned to sort with early on was Nebraska corn-fed beef. Because we got the first electronic ear tags that were made in 1992. And what that did is it mapped the dam and the sire of every calf we shipped. And we shipped 370 calves a year to Nebraska corn-fed beef to feed. And what I got back on every single calf based on the ear, ear tag was I got the carcass quality, the weight per day of age gain. I got everything on every single calf down the rail. The whole deal. That was an interesting thing. And I thought, why don't we just look at this simply with Highland and then try to figure it out? <clears throat> so what we did is we started taking a picture. We'd put 10 steers in. We free range our stuff. We don't feed them. In the sense that we don't feed them like they're fed in a feedlot or a pen or grain. But we'd put them in. We'd take a picture of 10 pick out what we thought were the best five, <clears throat> take a picture of the best five with an ear tag in their ear on the hoof, take them to the slaughter plant, kill them, and have the butcher leave the ear tag on each carcass. And then tell yourself how you did on the photograph, and then go to the rail and go look in the meat plant and see how you did. In the first 300 I did that way, what I did about 80% of this time and say, boy, I am really not very smart. I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I have no clue. How did I screw this up so badly? So the truth is you have no idea till you practice a lot at what you see with the height on standing in the field is going to look like hanging on the rail. So the last time I did the state fair, they had 69 pigs, 71 lambs, and 49 steers. And the State College, which is the egg school in Montana, said, well, how can you judge these on the hoof? And I said, it's fine. Don't worry about it. We can do it, maybe. Nobody can do that. You're right. Killed every animal, all the lambs, all the pigs, and all the cattle. And there was one mistake by the judge. He placed the steers one, two, three, four, five. And on the rail, they placed one, three, two, four, five out of 49 head. 69 pigs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on the rail, was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the ring, just like the cows were, and they killed every animal. 72 lambs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on the rail, was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the ring, everyone dead on. They said, nobody can do that. I said, you're right. The guys who could do this were in Omaha 75 years ago, and they walked through a pen and didn't kill the whole pen. They took the best tin out of the pen and killed them. But the only way we learned to do it is, I'm not kidding you, I killed 300 critter, critters to learn how to do that, and I screwed up probably 80% of them. We could not do it. So the same thing Angus is saying, I did. I had to go to the rail and see, but rather than just doing it that way, I had the map of what they looked like on the hoof versus with the ear tag on them and, and what they looked on the rail. I was like, God, am I a screw up? How did I blow this? But that's where we learned about brisket fat, that we learned about hip fat, where they carry the weight. Those things. So part of the deal of how do you keep yourself improved in terms of quality, if beef is part of the target and travelability is, that's the stuff to go look at. Is because when you see it on the rail, you have a good idea. The other thing is cows. If you kill grinders, which is what we call a cow that isn't infected or something, but she's got no teeth left and she's going to turn into ground beef or whoever else, you blend her with a bull to cut that, that's fine. But go look at them on the rail too. See how the cow that looked kind of drawn down or not so good, if you take three grinders to grind and kill, go see what they looked like and see what that was too, because that gives me a whole better idea of body condition score. And I don't like the conditions. People say she's got a body score four. Well, damn it, you can't really tell me that till you see her naked. And with her hanging there with nothing on her, then you're going to have a good idea what the body score really, really was when you see her that way. And that's what does it. I mean, I think if you look at your cows and you, when you bring them in and you, you wean your calves and stuff, I, I really think you can, you, you get a chance if they're in this squeeze you're going to, you can, I don't think you fool yourself. Well, it was an interesting thing to do it, and we yeah, wrote it yeah. down for years and looked, and I learned a whole lot better how much fat they actually carry or where they carry it by looking at them on the rail. Yeah, you'll yeah. see that, but I think when you weigh them and you look at them and you touch them if you want, but... 
I think it can be pretty accurate on, on your body condition. On, in a herd of brood cows, you're quite right, yeah. ja Jacqueline. If you know your cows, uh, at we weaning time, for instance, uh, the likelihood is the very best calves you will wean will come off the leanest cow in the place. It's kind of that simple. And don't feel sorry for this cow. No, 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 no. Because she's never actually going to look fat. Uh, she'll calve within probably two weeks of the pre previous ca calving. And she's still looking pretty lean. But she, she will be every bit as good to that calf. We, get, we place too much emphasis on visual appraisal. Yeah, they're a delight to the eye. When I take people around the few cows I have, and I've done this for years, they will pick out, wow, that's a good cow. Whoa, who is she? Old Jean, with the biggest calf in the place, whose face is always white with milk. They don't look at her. What age is she? She looks about 14. I said, no, she's eight. But why is she so lean? Look at that. That's why. They're, I love these cows. Never seen a show ring. You would, nobody would show them. We should have a class for that. <laughs> yeah, we, there should be a class at a show for this rather ropey looking old cow with this enormous offspring coming behind her. She wow. puts it into her calf yeah. instead of into herself. It's and wonderful. That's the cows yeah. you want. It's and wonderful. those are the ones it's hard to sort They're for. They're beautiful. Because it's easy to fall into the trap yeah. of, well, she doesn't hold any weight. She's not a good cow. But no, once you assess your own herd of cows, Jacqueline, you're right. <coughs> you know. Just well, by, the other thing yeah. that's interesting is that with cell phones and that kind of stuff, most people don't go to a farm and look at the animals anymore. They want pictures and videos and make a decision. And it's so, to me, it's so important if you're buying something new, if you've got the mom, the dam, and especially if it's summertime, she's got a calf on her side or something, and a bull on the property, to show those, pe those people who are interested what the dam looks like. And what the sire looks like, instead of just buying by. I'm not saying it's bad, but I just find it that you don't. People don't get that all, all that information. Then. I've never bought a bull without seeing its mother, and hopefully seeing its gra granny. Uh, yeah, the, the cows are the most important things in this breed. Yeah. High-performing cows. To go back to the information I was collecting over the years of the Highland steer business, uh, I bought several bull calves for, for other people purely on the information I had gathered over the years. I knew the top-performing cows in a lot of herds in Scot Scotland. And I have said to people, the next time... X726 calves, if it's a bull calf, keep it. Why? I said, just keep it. Never mind why. And I would sell those on to other uh, Highland beef producers. Almost with a guarantee that that will produce you Highland beef. I, the last three or four bulls I've bought, I've used the figures I collected at that time uh, to select them. And I've bought them for my sons as well on that in information. I would never go to an auction with a sale catalogue in my hand and buy an anything. No. You know, it's a nice way to spend time, but it's a nice way to spend a hell of a lot of money. Oh, don't listen to no, that. Angus, <laughs> I, I might put you on the spot a little bit. I, I'm listening to you talking. You talk about the great value of the information, Siren Dam and, and the quantitative uh, information you can gather on these cattle. At the same time, I hear you talking about let's not narrow the gene pool. Let's keep the gene pool as broad as possible. You're familiar with the EPDs and other breeds, but do you think EPDs would ruin the highlands? It's another tool. Uh, it's only as dangerous as we allow it to be. Uh, Breeding livestock is, you have a collection of tools in a, in a kit. And periodically, you'll pull out the spanner. Periodically, you'll pull out a hammer to, to fix whatever you're trying to achieve. None of these things are dangerous. Uh, it's how we use them. And all too often, uh, the importance we place upon them, we tweak it. You can tweak it like that, but... To 
build a hair based on that would be fo folly. Well, they've done that with Holsteins and Angus. Cat. Yeah, it, yes. It narrows the base yeah. so yeah. much. You can read by the numbers and you come up with oddball conservation. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I'm just trying to reconcile the, the value of information versus the danger of too much. Y yes, yeah. I have fought them for years, but here's the reason why I don't like them. The best consistency is inconsistency. And you need to remember that rule. You calve 600 cows in 50 days, and I want you to kill five steers every two weeks year round from the same cow herd. They need to be consistent. They need to be the same size. The ribeyes need to be close. The body fat needs to do it, and you do that on 10,000 acres of ground, 6,000 feet above sea level. Now, when you can do that, what you understand is a couple things. The only way you can pull that off is you have to have animals which grow inconsistently. I agree with Angus's deal. If I was feeding them, I want them all to finish the same day out of the pen. I'm not feeding them. They're free range. They're all over the place. So if they're all going to be the same size, the same weight, the same growth, the same day, how do I send a beef to the hospital in six months, in seven months, in eight months? What the packers did to us years ago is the packers and the buyers of cattle eliminated our ability to do what I do. Because everything that's Black Angus and Hereford finishes the same day, the same time, the same weight. So you can't free range them out, you can't do that and get them to be a consistent product. So I want the frames, I want the travel ability, I want the basics of the cows, but in terms of the growth rate, what EPDs did to the Red Angus is they all had to finish the same way, the same time, the same place. And there was a huge thing that they went to the shrink and the slide. So if they're too big, they shrink your weight, they take you down, they pay you less, they slide you off. If you're too small, too big, whatever else. So there was a huge incentive to not do what I do. And that was okay, but it was a good lesson for me that I didn't need the growth rate to necessarily be the same. And also the question became, is the growth rate poorer because they're inefficient? Do they not eat as much? Do they eat too much? Do they process as well? There's all these variables that I haven't gotten to in all these years. But it's a question. But to me, the best consistency came from I had to learn what it looked like with the hide on to know when to kill it. But the growth rate was inconsistent in all of them. And some bulls grew a lot faster. Some cows have faster calves. Some don't. But I don't want them all the same. Because if I get them all the same, I have to calve year-round. Or I, can't, I can no longer calve in 45 days. And I like calving in 45 days on green grass or 50 days on green grass. It's just a ton easier. And then I still have product year-round for all the people who are buying it. So we did it a different way. But it worked in the sense of that's how they did it 100 years ago. They didn't have feedlots then. Just a different way to look at it. OK, I'm going to kind of veer off in a little bit different direction, but it kind of ties into EPDs. Um, you mentioned in your talk yesterday, uh, Wally, about one of the older breeders um, who said that crossbreeding was a way that the Highlands not to not to improve on the highlands, but to improve on commercial breeds. Putting that, can you expand a little bit on that and on um, what that gentleman was thinking, and what your thoughts are about? I know what my thoughts are about moving highland genetics into a commercial breed, and what I think they can do. But what are your thoughts on that? He was thinking. He was progressive, and he was right. So um, we started doing it backwards to think about it. We read some of the old stuff. Walter Hill had tried it. We had those records from Montana State. But what we did in looking at it is we realized Highlanders have an incredibly small birth weight, which is nice. And what we learned from them was a thing we learned from no other cattle that we forgot. Don't be surprised at this. This is a weird thing to say. I care about the mothering skill of the cow. What I care about more than anything is the mothering skill of the calf. You never heard that from any commercial breeder in America. Jimmy Sitz, most expensive black Angus bulls in the country, none of their literature talks about the mothering skill of the calf. Here's what I learned. You take a red Angus heifer, breed her to a Highland bull, and the first day she calves, if she's never been around cows calving before and she walks off, a Highland calf will roll itself up, and it'll ball, she'll stop, it'll stumble up to her, she'll take one lick, and that calf will attach to that heifer. Then I was trailing pairs 19 miles 
400 pairs at a time, 19 miles to summer grass with a saddle horse. And what was nice about that is, is you trail those pairs and when you got there, every single Highland calf was right by its mom. And we learned that not from the Highland cows, they did it, but we weren't trailing that many of those. These were red Angus cows with a grafted Highland calf and every grafted Highland calf was stuck to its side. So what we learned by doing the crossbreds that were 50-50 was, wait a second, they keep longevity, they keep the efficiency, they browse better, they don't browse as well as the Highlanders, but all these pluses came out of the deal and a lot of them come out polled. Black Angus would not poll them because there's so much in Black Angus stein as we call them now, um, because there's so much stuff bred in black cattle, but they did it well. So who took the first load of all of those crossbred red Angus for me was John Ligo. And that was 14 years ago? 13 years ago, a long time. 18 how many years? 18 years ago. Oh my God. Sorry, well, you shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> I shouldn't have. Thank you, Angus. Good tip. But the nice part is he still has the progeny of those cows, and some of his best cows are the cows we call the redheads. She's had 17 cows. And she's had, and she's half Highland, half Red Angus, and she came from the Red Angus pool of cows that we sold in Nebraska corn fed beef for years. But the crossbreds did fabulously, and they do well. And so what we sell to a lot of people now, I have one milking shorthorn bull, and what we sell are what I call homestead milk cows. Because all these people who want to go back to raw milk go to whatever else. Jerseys are great, but all winter they stand there going, it's cold, it's cold, I can't milk, it's cold, I can't cold. Guernsey's a too thin skin tool, but you have a Highland cross with a milking shorthorn, you don't get a lot of milk, but the butter fat is incredible, and they last a long time, and they don't fall off in the winter. So all these people who want a homestead milk cow are happy to buy a Lewing, especially if they're roan. And we get a lot of those out of a roan bull. So there is a huge merit to crossing them. And Angus saw a lot of it, I'm sure, in Scotland, but Campbell did a bunch of this like 200 years ago where he let a whole bunch of shorthorns out with Highland cows for years because they didn't know what to do with them because they wanted marl. They were after fat in those days. And they put shorthorns out with the Highlanders to get more fat on their back, and they worked fabulously. That was the preferred beef for a long time. So I'd say there's a huge merit to do it. We just have to keep the Highland gene pool and the Highland cows true to themselves, so we have a batch to ship out, because once you start crossing them, you lose those offspring. They're no longer Highland, they're crossbreds. So you would, you would say crossing a commercial breed with a Highland bull is a better way to go as opposed to a commercial bull with a Highland cow? Yep, and breed your heifers to a Highland bull. Yeah, okay. commercial bulls and- We refer to ours, our Highland bull, so. And those are good, uh, yes, that was the Max Beeler did. At the period we were talking about yesterday, the 1920s, when a large number of Highland cattle came into this country, what one has to bear in mind, at that time, the vast majority of Highland cows were crossed to shorthorn bulls. There was far more profit in that than keeping them purebred, hoping somebody would be interested in the offspring. That almost finished the Highland breed. You guys were taking the cream of the crop. Yeah. The, the gentleman whom we spoke Walter about. Walter Hill, etc. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they weren't cattle that nobody wanted. They weren't the bottom end of anybody's cattle. There were three herd dispersals between 1922 and 25. All the best cattle from those herd dispersals came to the United States. We were walking a very tight line at that time in relation as to will the Highland breed survive. I was saying the vast majority were being put to a shorthorn bull because there was an enormous demand for the fe females of that cross. Uh, you probably all know that uh, the Cadzo brothers from the island of Ling in the west of Scotland realised the potential of this wonderful cow and eventually the Ling breed evolved from that. They saw just how good they were. They were equally as hardy as their mothers. They were great converters and they lived and lasted a very long time. Uh, I have the entire set of Highland cattle herd books at home. And if you look at those, you'd see how close the Highland breed became to not being extinct, 
but becoming a very, very rare breed. Uh, one of those volumes of my herd books, there were, I think, 37 fe females re registered in one year and 15 bulls. That's how serious the situation became, simply because of the popularity and the value of the Cross Highland offspring and you guys bringing the cream of the crop here. Having said that, uh, my daughter runs a herd of 60 Cross Highland Shorthorn cows. She does this herself. In the last three years, she's only had to assist two cows, one reverse and one a heifer that wasn't particularly big. Uh, they're never in. They run on open hill ground. Some mornings when she goes to feed them, five of them are missing, probably ca calving somewhere. Uh, they turn up, quite often without a calf. You don't automatically assume that this calf is dead. If you are observant and you look below this cow, if you can observe these teats have been suckled, if you don't see that calf for a week, you don't worry. She'll come, she'll bring the calf when the calf's re re ready to come. Now, everyone else in the island is running cross Charolais and cross Simmental cows. They have vet bills that would pay your mo mortgage. Every third cow that calves, a caesarean. Uh, who's doing the job right? They're, they're living in grossly expensive bu buildings, these cows. The capital involved in uh, beef production in Britain is ridiculous. And they wonder why the margins are so tight. You would need to be insane to do it. Uh, between the machinery you need to produce for forage, buildings you need because these animals really shouldn't be outside for eight months of the year, and the vet bills. Uh, I think my daughter Joan's got this right. Yeah, if you, you want to stay in the beef business, you get the biggest track of rough grazing you can find in Scotland and let them go. And the Cross High Highlander is wonderful at do, doing that. Uh, some of the best Cross Highland cows I've ever seen were in northern Vermont with Hen Henry Cars. He ran... He ran a Highland herd, and he also bred sh Charolais. He crossed the bottom end of his Charolais cows with a hi Highland bull, and the female offspring of them, wow, they were cows. They were cows and a half. Amazing looking cattle. I've got photographs of them at home, and nobody believes they're cross hi Highland cows. The Charolais is an amazing converter of food. S very similar to the hi Highlander. There was uh, scientific experiments done in Scotland about 40 years ago by an extremely interesting professor, Basil Lo Lohman. And uh, the two breeds that came out on top in relation to food conversion were the Highlander and the Char Charolais. They were both getting fed different diets, but they won. They won hands down in the ability to convert food. I also knew a Highland breeder in the north of Scotland who ran a very famous Highland fold, but he also had a dairy, 30 uh, Frisian cows it was in those days. And he would uh, put the Highland bull on his free Frisian he heifers. Again, the offspring of that were extremely good suckler cows. So there's all sorts of things you can do with high Highland genetics. You can shuffle this pack lots of ways and run very commercial bu businesses. If you, for instance, were to decide to cross your entire... No, I'm not saying you will, but if you were to do so, the only issue you have is to find female replacements, female hi Highland replacements. Uh, yeah, but no, 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 I think we don't bang the drum loud enough in relation to just how commercial this Highlander can be and what you can do, do with it. Just to comment on EPD, I've used Red Angus, you have to use Red Angus on Highland cows. And so if you're going to crossbreed with an Highland cow, I found the Red Angus EPD for temperament and calving needs to be very important because you could end up with too big of a calf. Um, but generally, Red Angus have smaller calves with high growth rates, but I found that was useful. I never had 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the, possibly one of the reasons why my daughter seldom, if ever, has a calving problem. These cows are physically extremely fit. They aren't lying around. They're not, you want calving problems? You bring cows inside and let them lie, lie in a shed. You'll have calving problems, almost regardless of what breed or what cross you're wo working with. These cows are physically extremely fit. They walk miles every day. Uh, it, isn't it terribly sad that we have to use the word calving ease? <laughs> what, have we, no, what have we done to cattle? When I started in the cattle business, that calving ease wasn't an issue. What, you know, what are we doing to them? I mean, all sorts of breeds. I, I hate the word. And all the breeds, all the major breeds in Britain put so much emphasis on this simply because we messed up. It's the most natural thing in the world for a cow to do is calf. Oh, and people sit up all night watching them. Oh, no. Oh, don't, I'm getting, I'll start getting on a high horse. So the way it was easiest, though, to, to get people to buy the question or to believe in the question of crossing them was when you took first calf heifers, whatever breed, and bred them to a Highland bull, you eliminated all sorts of issues with calving first calf heifers. And then if you cream off the best first calf heifers that you ha have out of that batch of calves, pick out the best 10 out of 75 or 100 and see what they're going to turn out like, then all of a sudden it converts your thinking to, wait a second, these cows do work. They work well. That was what it did. It was an educational question. And the mistakes were, the other problem with the EPDs, we took the EPDs for growth, the EPDs for milk, and what happened is we crashed their udders. So my rules were simple. I wanted a birth weight, 81 pounds or less. I want a 205 weight of 701 or more. And I want a yearling weight, 365 day weight of more than 1102. No and believe me. Based on anything over a year old. What? No EPDs for any breed are based on anything over two years old. No, I was doing actual weights. But here's my problem was when I, when I took the EPDs and looked at those numbers that grew for the little stuff, what we did is I got too damn much milk in them. So I started crashing udders in red Angus cows and started doing that wrongly because I never weighed so clearly then the question of butter fat versus the question of milk volume versus the question of weight. So I screwed up and LC Kring's Pride's proprietor screwed that up years and years ago because when you look at their udders, the rear teats are below the front teats and they milk like a pig. They're great and they have more butter fat than you can imagine. But when you get that look, what happens is their udders crash when the cow's 10. So you had to find bulls to breed those cows too that didn't have the sloped teeth problem in the back and then you solved it. And that's what it did. But we lost like 10 or 15 good cows that were really good genetics except for the fact their udders would crash because they were just the wrong way to do it. And we did butcher them. But it was a shame to lose them because I knew who'd put the work into building a lot of those and they were all L.C. King's pride from the early 50s. But that was a problem. Uh, commercial herds, yes. Uh, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, the person who does the most recording is my son, Ian on Mull. He records everything, but just for his own use. Uh, and it helps him. In his, he, he does it with his sheep as well. Oh, no. So we don't have no, you need an enormous amount of information. To Yeah, that's, yeah. It's a small breed of very optical information, you know, not the problem of many of us, but one of the best sources of information I've collected through the years is by, I give, I've been donating, uh, uh, providing uh, steers, 4-H steers to anybody that will take them 
not for the 4-H, only for the carcass contest. And I'm a, I find the kids, and they sign them up. I keep them. I do all the work. They take them to the fair. And uh, it's interesting. Now, most of them are not pure Highland. They're Highland Cross. And I've, I've, I've crossed, you name it, I've done it, everything. Cemental, Hereford. Right now, I'm very prejudiced towards the Red Angus. But I've been doing this for years. And kids love it. They get they get in. And they enter it. They come. And you take this down and we're in the county there. And it's it's really fun actually. And I get I'm, I'm got a sick sense of humor, but and <laughs> we get down there and they judge these carcass forage steers on the move. And then the same judge judges them on the rail at the butchers. And that's the only way to judge between the 12th and 13th group. And the Dendonald steers, I think the best place they've ever been is maybe like fifth. But they usually, on, on the hoof, they usually go seventh, eighth, the last one, the best one we had was like 10th out of 13th on the hoof. And graded prime, number one. Never seen a Highland grade prime in my life. This was, this was high, uh, Highland Red Angus. But uh, <coughs> uh, in fact, the, the, some of these judges. I, of course, I love it, I know you, but, but th this is, I could, it's an easy way to collect data with a small breeder, you know, and I've convinced a lot of people because they go, we go down there and you see them hanging and it's kind of nice to see that. Uh, and it's an easy way to collect data as a, as a relative small breeder, and you're also doing something in the community. And what do you, so, the kid gets the money, and uh, you've done something decent, and we could all do it. Very, and uh, you, I've done it with purebred island, but mostly the, the purebred island, we, we, the kid, we couldn't get them finished in time. You know, just a matter of time. So we've done it, we've done it, the greatest success we've had is with the cross Highland steer. And we've been doing this for years in Joe County. See. And uh, we've surprised and pissed off a lot of people. <laughs> so do we. So, I think and not, we have the problem is we've got very little data. I think one of the greatest things we ever did for a few years was the bull test. The Highland. Yes. We did bull tests, bull lips that run them, Joe Violent Corp run them, and we did some, we collected some goddamn good data mm -hmm. in a few years in the bull test, and at the, I'd love to see someone volunteer to do it again, but, uh, and we and we quit it because breeders wouldn't participate. And it was interesting to see, because Jack and Kelly, we know, it was interesting to see uh, the it's so-called shoring bulls versus the other bulls. It was great. And it was, we've got, I've got all that data today. I've still got it all. And we, and the brief, we never used it. We never did anything with it. But it's a, it, it was a very uh, valuable tool. We had, what, typically 20, 20 some, 20 plus. Um, I think we had, some years we had 25. And, Joe did it also. Joe Valencourt did it, and uh, that, that's not some of the best data we've had. But it's very difficult because uh, most of us are relatively small, and it's very difficult collecting any kind of data on your on your animals. Uh, so I've kind of worked it with my own way, and uh, one of the things I. I, I, I'm convinced that there are damn few dominant Highland bulls, but there are a hell of a lot of 
Dung and cows. I would agree, and I haven't been doing it that long. And, uh, but it still uh, collecting information, and, and uh, it's lacking. It's a pity we don't don't share more of it. The, the saddest part goes back to me to your question that to start today, which is, I don't care how well you gain weight, if you can't walk, if your legs break down, if you have no ribeye, if you've got the attitude of a tiger, I want nothing to do with you. I don't care what the hell you gain weight like. So the basic stuff of your question is, what do we do to keep our herd intact? And Angus's answer too, to me, if we look hard at the question of people buying stock to crossbreed with, et cetera, it simply needs to be good stock. And if it is not good stock, the minute you start selling garbage out to people who are crossbreeding with stock that is not good stock, all you've given us is a huge black eye and that hurts the breed that much more. So people need to be aware of the basics, learn the basic simple stuff. So Eddie's got a good batch of cows that he's doing this with, but a lot of people do not. But what I'm saying is, if we have the basics right and you get pretty much in your batch what you want to improve to there, and that's what your crossbreed or other people buy from you to crossbreed with, that makes a huge difference. And if you want to know what difficult is, you find a milking shorthorn bull in 14 states in the West that's for sale, that's any good. They are damn hard to find because nobody kept milking shorthorns once the dairy buyout went down in the 70s and 90s. So they're hard to find to do that. And they also lost all the gene pool they had for those bulls and those cows because they killed all of them. And the few people who kept them had junk and they'd sell them to people. And what they sold was basically garbage and didn't work. So it was really hard to find the closed herds that were people who'd kept them and been silent about it. And we don't want to end up there. So I think Angus's idea is perfect. Get what you want, get it there. But I think if we're going to look hard at doing 4-H stuff, we have never had a crossbred animal ever lose a carcass contest at a fair. We have never won a fair. We have never had a crossbred or a full bed highland win, ever. But we have never had one lose a carcass contest. That's a quite a record for 25 years. But because nobody can compete with the carcasses. Could I explain what the bull test was for people who are, is there, they stopped doing it for quite a number of years. Um, Bull tests typically that are run at universities and things don't take on highland because of horns. And they're also usually those bulls are kept in large pens and weighed, weighed for a certain amount of time. What the highland people did is they you had to have a certain weaning weight and the animal would be collected into, into these two various farms that were doing it. Um, they were socialized and intermingled for a month to get used to the situation. Then they were fed a certain amount a day, but they had to, it was in troughs. And they were then every month uh, weighed twice the same day. Uh, and then over a period of, from November until the middle of April, they did that. And then they were seen tested, fertility, you know, fertility tested, all that kind of stuff. And then auctioned off after that. Um, as a group, you know, the, and um, what you had to, got, got to see is a number of animals from different areas of the country put together, how they did, so it was a mixed group of animals, and between the weight and the spurtle circumference and that kind of stuff, you can make some choices. Um, and it was a great way to see how, what happens with all these animals brought from different farms. One of the things that happened, they found out, was the animals that were the fighters did not gain weight well. It was the, you know, the calm dispositioned animals that could get along in a feed bunk with others that performed best. And it was a way, I mean, there were people, farms, who made their reputations on how well their animals did. And they, they went on to produce good animals. And it was a way to see, evaluate a whole group of animals without having to, you know, go to individual farms. They did get to the point where animals were not a certain percentage of animals didn't have a certain sort of circumference or didn't gain a certain amount of weight for over the period of time, did not make the sale. That did upset some people. 
but um, it, was, it was a really great way to see the animals and, and evaluate them that you can't do by just going to farms. Well, you see the performance under the same set of That's circumstances. Right. That's right. Versus I might mm -hmm. feed mine differently than you might yeah. feed yours. And versus Tennessee and Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. It's a, it's it's really it's a lot. Of, it was a lot of work for those people. I meant okay. I'm sorry. I know. I have one quick question on the property. At what percentage do you think the Highland, like three quarter commercial, one quarter Highland? At what point do you think the Highland qualities come out of a crossbred? When you pass, when you're less than a quarter Highland, they start to lose the browse. They lose the rest yeah, of it. They yeah, lose the yeah, winter yeah. efficiency. Okay. If you're half and half, if you're three quarter, one quarter, you hold most of the Highland traits, although it doesn't look like a Highlander. But when you pass the quarter, you lose it. And I was in the middle of the bull test in the West stuff because we've run them for Herefords and stuff for 50 years, which was great. But here was the lesson. By saying this is the minimum weight to go into this, you want this weaning weight, what we did is we eliminated anything that didn't make that way. I want 1.1 pounds per day of age out of a Highlander. I want to kill them between 30 and 40 months. On the range, never fed up. That's what I want. Anything that meets that specification for what I do for beef couldn't go to the bull test because they didn't gain enough weight to get to the weaning weight. So what the bull test did is the stuff that grew slow that was there got eliminated from the test. All that gene pool, all those genes, all those other traits were lost. And Val and, Ky or and I argued this so we were blue in the face because he was new to it and I was not. And I said, look, I'll send you 10 bulls if you want 10 bulls in your test, but this is the rules that you got to do this by because this is not what you want to be doing because that's it. But he was trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear in the sense of the Black Angus boys and stuff were doing all the testing. And I said, if you want to do it right, here's the thing. The guys in Montana will run it twice for you. I want these bulls, when they're weaned in the fall, let's run the bull test the first year, run them another eight months, bring them back the second fall, and run them another time. The same batch of bulls. If they're going to truly mature slowly, if you're going to breed two-year-old heifers to calve at three, the bulls should be no more pubic-wise mature. They shouldn't reach puberty as early. So run the same bulls through a test twice and get it right. And that concept was so alien to University of Wyoming, they just couldn't quite get it. And I said, wait a second. Look at what cows were 50 years ago. Nobody calved two-year-old heifers that were calving. They weren't breeding ones for twos. We were breeding twos for threes. So do it. So they didn't do it. So the tragedy of the bull test to me was we lost a whole lot of genes in that pool. But the beauty of it is Jacqueline's dead right. People suddenly could see what they looked like, see what the differences were. It was a great exercise in frame structure, frame weight, carcass weight. All those things showed up in the pens that you could see. Great educational tool, but there was a lot of genes out there that should not have been lost that way. I don't remember what the minimum weight was, but it was an unreasonable weight. So the bull test, was it um, you know, Highland specific or yes. was it Highland specific? Highland's so only. One, one of the great things of the Joe Brown bull test that came out of it, Joe run the bull test and he had Highlands and then he had the other breeds. He was from Ottawa and of course we got weekly reports. And the amazing thing was uh, the rate of gain, the, he's in Wyoming, of course. Yeah. The, the Eastern Bull Tests were run upstate New York, but Joe was in Wyoming. And uh, once they get down to that bitter cold winter, the rate of gain of the Highland Bull was nearly double the other breeds. And then in the warmer weather, it just reversed. So, that, that, that data, it was fascinating. Do you remember what the minimum weight was for the, for the, I mean, the, that, for us, at, at I, least I've got all of that data, if anybody's interested in it, I don't you remember. know, if anybody's yeah. interested in it, I can provide it, because I was fascinated, I, I was sorry to see it go. Yeah. And, uh, John, you have a question. Well, we were first in the Highland Association, the first time I met Angus was, I think, in 2005 down in Missouri. And the thing I remember that stuck with me the most was temperament. And I've always said to our customers, temperament leads to tenderness. If you don't have calm animals, you've got a problem. 
So in my mind, you know, I always tell people, don't sell them to someone else, butcher them for burger or whatever, to just get rid of them. Because temperament, in my mind, of the traits you mentioned, is right up there at the top. Because if they're it's mean and ornery, you got problems. Yeah, great. Temperament is probably one of the most important factors in quality meat production and very few people pay a terrible amount of attention to it. One of the reasons is uh, modern production methods, you're seldom near the ca cattle. Nobody really assesses them as individuals and it's only when you go to possibly send them to the slaughterhouse, you begin to realise, whoa, they weren't too easy to handle. Now, I've had cattle from certain folds in Scotland that I almost couldn't finish correctly because of their te temperament. They, all the energy they had was bu burnt up. They, they didn't graze correctly. They were always looking around or fighting or being aggressive with the an animal ne next to them. It mm, should be eliminated from the Highland breed. It, in general, it's not too bad in the Highland breed, but there are two particular strains in the breed. And again, I sort of was able to identify that by all the various uh, weight recordings I was doing, that I would never advise anybody to keep stock from. And that all stemmed from a bull I could identify that was born in 1950-something. And it's still, you can still trace this temperament right through the whole line. Yeah. I have a question. Over the number of years you've been associated with Highlands, what changes have you seen in the Highlands in the United States that, have made, that you consider bad? Oh, have bad. Their, have their calves... Possibility that nurse, I, I'm here, maybe social media, but so many <coughs> assistance to black um, Has that changed? Is it happening? Well, if, right, to answer that particular part of the question for me is virtually impossible. Had I been looking after cow herds in America over the last 20 years, I might have a go at it. But the change, right, what changes have I seen since I've been coming here? Uh, right, I, I won't use the show, show ring. I was very fortunate to see a number of herds in Vermont and New Hampshire and around that area back in 87. Uh, I was seriously impressed with the quality of cattle I saw there. I mean, I thought the Highland breed is okay. It, it will survive. Um, when I, then when I saw cattle in the shoring in De Denver, I thought, what's happened in a relatively short space of time? I got the impression that the people who were enthusiastic with showing had never seen these cattle that I had seen several years e earlier. I saw cows with Henry Cars, I saw cows in Pitcher Mountain, I even caught Colin da Davidson had some outstanding cattle. Uh, they would have won any show in Denver had they taken them there. For some reason, the show people seem to think the perfect Highlander is something that I don't see. And, and I, I'm not terribly sure uh, where you're going in that respect. I find it puzzling. Even the last time I was in De Denver, I was scratching my head a bit. You know, where are you going? What do you see in this type? And, and it's not really the type that Wally has been describing to us over the last two days. Bigger, taller, fat. Oh, the no, yeah. but fat's something we do. That's not, that's something we, the fault lies with us with regards fat. Yeah, that's not the beast's fault. It's what we are doing to it. And over a period of time, there could be a tendency for these people to focus on animals that will respond and weigh this ridiculous weight at two years of age. Uh, that's not what the Highland breed is all, all about. I have to admit, that over that period of time, I became somewhat concerned after the last time I was in Denver, if this is what a lot of people consider 
the Highland breed to be. Yeah, I thought you're maybe going in the wrong direction here. Yeah. Dog. And so they have asthma, they don't know what to do, and that's where they reach out. And they don't have local resources to reach out to. Well, but even for us as a new farm, mm -hmm. and anybody else that's trying to get into it, as my husband and I as a new farm, I tell everyone this sounds terrible. I love you. Um, find an oldie moly, honestly, that knows what they're talking about and that their morals and values align. You know, we got, uh, some people here know us, we do go out and show. Um, I think, you know, some of the things that are particularly unique, especially since I grew up on an Angus farm in Wyoming, and my husband grew up on a dairy farm, and now we're doing Highlands. So, you know, it's very different. So for us, it, it's unique to see, you know, especially at shows, like some of the animals that are, you know, what you would consider as overweight or a little bit chunkier than what a standard or what we've been shown a highland should look like, you know, shaving and then, then looking closer to an Angus than an actual what we would have been taught and seeing what a true highland is. But I really think, especially when you're talking about social media, I hate social media because we've run into other farms that are new and they were taken for a ride and bought an animal that was super expensive and was told registration doesn't matter. So I always just think that, and this is just putting it off on some of you guys too, is, is that I appreciate any education I can get. I know I've spoken to Cindy, I've spoken to Anne, I've, I've spoken to a lot of you and asked questions because I'll be humble. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I know how to pull a cow and I know how to do that stuff. But the social media screws it up because they make it like this is a pretty cow that you can put in your front yard. And it's totally okay. And nothing's going to happen. And oh, they're super docile. Even at their farm, we have people that try to hop the fence because they're just so pretty. Now, I could hop the fence. We can hop the fence. You certainly may. So I think that's the hardest part with the social media and the shows. And... You know, people go to shows and they see this and they think, you know, this is the way it is. And, you know, and each farm does their own jam. I have no ill will on any farm that does their own thing. That's how they want to run their operation. Have at it. I totally respect you for that. But I think that's the biggest thing is there's younger farms that want to get into it and have bigger herds and build up. And, you know, it's just having the ability to have those conversations and being strong enough and humble enough to know you don't know what you're doing. Well, when having an animal that's sick and they don't call the vet, they wait. They they wait. They ask on yeah. social media. Yeah. I'm going. What, by the time you get around to realizing you your vet, this this animal's going to be dead. Right. You know where you see somebody who's calving and they've got a hoof out. Oh, the hoof's been out for ten hours. Well, that calf's dead, so you need to really probably call. I mean, we're lucky enough. We have children, and some of them are working a veterinary program, so we really, and I'm a nurse, so it kind of makes our life a little bit easier on that aspect. But when you start seeing some of those questions, you just, I get mortified. And that's why anybody who tells us, especially when we educate at the fairs, and they say, oh, I really want to do this, I tell them, find someone who knows, someone who's been doing it for 20 years. Not five, not eight, not me. Sure as hell, not me. Any of those people, and make a friend. Do you don't you think all of this has kind of is taken our breed down? Yeah. That worries me. Well, yeah, but you know, the bottom line is the hobbyists are the bread and butter of our, right. of our association in terms of money. So our job as breeders is to help them as much as we can, because right. they may only have three or four cows. That, you know. But I'm wondering how things evolve because he's got a herd out there that can have a calf and nobody's going to be there to, to get a six that calf to latch on and keep going. And now I hear more and more people are going, I got this calf that won't latch on. Is that a problem with the size bulls that we're trying to push? I mean, that will be seen ginormous bulls in the ring. I think I, that's the standard. I would give you a different answer. I think I would look at it a different way. You've got a couple things going on. Black cattle did this years ago. The more people who keep this structure on the back of a cow, the narrower the pelvis. So if you have this shape of back, a letter U, which is a bigger ribeye, a bigger tenderloin, a bigger rib loin, what you have is a broader pelvis. So you can calf. 
And that's a simple deal, but the people did the pelvic measurements tied that to the rest of the question years ago, and they still do it. So we don't buy and sell black Angus heifers in Montana without a pelvic on them. Same with red Angus. The big breeders don't do that. That's what it is, number one. Number two, I think Angus's point, he and I are from the same school. We run a Lamaze program for pregnant cows, <laughs> which basically means fitness is critical. Yep. And I think what I see more and more of at Denver and what I see more and more of, I have people come and say, your cows suck, Wally. They're too skinny. No, they're not skinny. What they are is they're range cattle and they're fit. Yeah. And they walk. I walked my cows for years at Dow, three and a half miles one way to water. And they graze a whole mountain. When you got 10,000 acres to graze, that's what they do. They're fit. They can cover the ground. They can travel the country. And that's what they do. But most people who have five acres, two acres, and feed them too much, yeah. they're not fit. So you have a cow who's not fit trying to calve. And when she stands up, her calf is also not fit because it's too fat too. So it doesn't latch on well. So the other thing I've kind of learned is some of the question happened that we're not keeping a structure which is good basics about cows. And we also are doing simple things like keep them fit. And if they're fit, they do much, much, much better. That's our problem as the operator. It's operator error, not so much blame the cow error. It's operator yeah. error. Yeah, all too often it's, it's, we get bogged down in genetics. Quite often you have to ask yourself, what, it, what part of this problem is genetic and what part of it is envi environmental? I've often asked myself about that about te temperament. Are the reason these cattle are as wild as they are is because the day they were spaying, nobody ever went near them. They were fed from a distance for two years, then they just suddenly decided to round them up and whoa, all hell breaks loose. Now, how much of that is genetic or what elements of it are purely the result of the environment which they were kept in? It, it's, it's a hard one and there are several other uh, traits like that. Others, for instance, those people who calve their cows when there's grass like this and the udders are like this, the day they calve, whoa, that is bad news. Part of the reason calves don't latch on. Teats, no. Um, I usually calve my cows February, March. Now, I know it's tough. Highland cows are tough. I know there could be snow. We have an average rainfall of 90 inches. It could rain for two weeks. But these cows know what they're doing. And at that time, they will only have the quantity of milk the calf actually needs. The udder isn't bursting. As the spring comes on and the calf's appetite grows, the cow then has the ability to produce more milk, but calving late in the year is one of the best ways to get calving problems. Not so much in a situation like yours, Wally, where there's never an awful lot of anything to eat. <laughs> but in a rich pa pasture, keeping Highlanders in a seriously rich pasture and it's calving them in the summer is a recipe for disaster. Well, Yeah. And they don't need it. Um, I mean, I fight fat. We are out of time. Are we? Yeah, we just hit the end of time. You can do one more comment. We're out of time. I don't know what maybe Angus and I were talking. Maybe it's a phase. Maybe it'll pass. This too shall pass. 
Maybe it'll teach me tolerance. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, so Andy, it won't. Okay. Way of evaluating <laughs> go for it. This is our last question, then. Go ahead. Okay, what do we speak of? It's actually some comments. Uh, we came in here, we all came in here talking about cattle. Right. <laughs> cool. Oh, hi. Yeah. Yep. 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 Can we go? We can go. <laughs> They're kicking us out. So They're kicking us out. <laughs>